made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is expected, is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. All things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him. Who put all things in subjection under him, that it God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right, and do not go on sinning. Some have no knowledge of God. I say this. What have we read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient. May we be stirred again anew and afresh today. Begin to think about, in fact, Christ has. Thank you. Please be seated. Someone has said that that since that first resurrection, where Jesus came out of the tomb three days after having been crucified, that we've been living in a, in, a, in a season of Easter ever since. And we're living between the resurrection of our Savior and the final resurrection of all the redeemed. Paul is speaking to this subject without using the term Easter. Easter, approaching in two Sundays from now, affirms, accentuates the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't gather here with the notion that He, that he spiritually was raised, that we, that we feel like He was raised, that we feel better if we think He was raised, or, or the idea, the possibility stirs us on we gather with an infallible certainty. Christ risen. One of the ways the early church engaged one another when they met one another is they would say, Christ is risen. And the response would be, is risen indeed. That should be our hope today. See, Revelation 20, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with Him for a thousand years. Here's the, here's the reality, folks. Every one of you sitting here has experienced a first birth. Scripture talks about it. Every one of you sitting here either has experienced the second birth, being born again, or needs to experience the second birth. Because you see, unless the Lord Lord Jesus tarries is coming, every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve who has ever lived except, except Enoch and Elijah have experienced the first death. This past year, you have buried loved ones. Days to come, we will do so. Jesus tarries. If he tarries long enough, you and I will experience the first. But the math of Scripture is that if you only experience the first birth, you will experience the first death and the second death. But if you experience the second birth, then you will only experience the first. 
not dying, eternally separated from God. Perish, torment. Paul is thinking about this as he exhorts the Corinthians to turn the resurrection. He had said to the, to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that is dead, those who've died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so there's the death and resurrection of Christ center point here. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, that is, those who've died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, <clears throat> that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, if they've died, they're already with him. If they've died in the Lord, they're already with him. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, he said, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home, our, our bodies, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, our glorified. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Jesus was teaching the parable of the, of the banquet that you should, when you hold a banquet, don't, don't bring your friends and your relatives and those who can do something for you. Go out and invite the poor and those who cannot return the favor. He says in Luke 14, 14, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just, that is the justified, those who died in faith, those who died believing in Jesus. John 5, 29, come out, those who've done good to the resurrection of life and those who resurrection of judgment you see. Just as there's a first death, possibility of a second death if you die apart from Christ. Just as there's a first resurrection, second, first birth and first death. Two resurrections. There's a resurrection of the of the redeemed. There's the resurrection. Not redeemed. Being resurrected, who had be joined together, body, soul. Fraternity with God. Resurrection of the unredeemed. Gathered, cast, in the lake of fire. So we want to think in thinking today about this passage. First, think about the reality of the resurrection and the redeemer. That's look later reality of the resurrection and the redeemed. Then the reality of the resurrection and the restoration. And finally, the reality of the resurrection ending incentives. How do we provoke one another? Light. Inevitable. Return of Jesus. The inevitable resurrection where the body joins soul and spirit. Eternity with First of all, the reality of the resurrection and the Redeemer, verses 20 to 22. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, this verse here should remind you of what we read in Romans 5. By a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection. of For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all die. Be made alive. So Paul reaffirms, he does all through this passage, historical fact, a theological truth, 
of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. He told them as he opened up chapter 15, you yourselves believed this. Paul would never have given them any hope in Corinth that any of them were followers of Christ, were Christians, had they not affirmed the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And here, he talks about how Jesus become, or is, really the, the idea here is he's raised from the dead, the first fruits. The first fruits of all who have died in him. This idea of first fruits comes out of the harvest season for the, for the Israelites. He's drawing upon this to teach a lesson. Gentiles would have known something about first fruit in terms of their own harvest. But in Leviticus 23.10, here was the difference. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Gentiles didn't necessarily do that. The Jews were taught in their harvesting festivals and principles that if you sowed and, and you sowed and then the shaft begins to come through the ground and, and the plant begins to grow and nurture and, and it comes to maturity, it doesn't all come to maturity exactly the same. It comes nearly so, but when it's obvious that God has blessed you, that you're not going to experience a drought, and you see that those first sheaves, those first evidences that you'll have a harvest, that you take those, you go and present them to the priest. It was a way to acknowledge God has blessed me. This has come from God. And the priest, of course, would use this as a part of their own uh, sustenance and a part of the sacrifice rituals. They were to look for it. They were to act upon it. They were to honor and acknowledge God's hand in it. Paul says, that's what Jesus is. You look for God to bless. He came as the blessor. You acknowledge that in Jesus you have hope just as they acknowledged in cutting the, the first sheaves that they had hope of their own harvest that would sustain their family, that would allow them to operate in the marketplace. Jesus' death, he had said earlier in his ministry, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, referring to germination, cannot come forth to live. That's what Jesus did. He died, came back to life. We who face death might have the hope of life. He's the first fruits. He's, he's the promise. God, how do I know? How do I know that if I trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that I will, that death will be turned into a vehicle to transport this life, eternity with God? How do I know that? Jesus is. His resurrection proves that he is all whom he declared himself to be. It's infallible proof that he did and would continue doing all that he claimed he would do. It's the infallible proof that God, who gives promises, is true to his promise. Jesus, first fruit. Grieving because the loved one departed recent days, months. I still. But my hope is he is with the Lord. By his grace, shall be too. Is that good person? Have I been a good person? No. Salvation by grace through faith, the one who conquered sin and death and hell and the grave, Jesus Christ.
Paul understood that when believers die, they go to be with the Lord immediately. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home. Philippians 1, 23. I'm hard-pressed between the two. When he was talking about struggling, that he, that he, he was... He was weary. He'd had enough beatings, stoning, enough attacks by wild animals. He, he wanted to go. I visit with Brother Charlie Ward fairly, fairly regularly, and every time, every time without faith, I want to go home. Tell him, he's got his plan for you. That was Paul in this passage in Philippians. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. It comes to conclude in this passage of Christ for now, because God's letting him live. It's better for him to live and labor on. There. What we read a while ago, Romans 5, idea, one man, Adam, spend one time, Plunged all of his offspring downward, gravity. Call it the fall. Fall of Adam. The passage we read in Romans, of course, talked about that through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. That's why Jesus is sometimes referred to as the second Adam. First Adam comes and God said, keep all of this, do this and live. He did not do this. Failed his wife. Failed himself. Cast out of the garden, out of paradise. Because of their... Jesus came. He didn't have to complete just one act of obedience. It's interesting. Romans 5, Paul sums up the life and ministry of Jesus. Is one act of his entire life. John Calvin says he doesn't think Adam made it through the Sabbath. Jesus made it all sorts of things. A man of sorrow, despised and rejected by men. He came into his own and his own received him not. He was accused of being demonic by his own kinsmen. He was called Beelzebub by the religious leaders. He was called a traitor, a blasphemer by Rome. Faithful. Never sinning. Never sinning in word. Never sinning in thought. Never sinning in deed. His one grand act of obedience. His life. Just as Adam's act of disobedience. Placed the many setting of being born sin. Jesus' life of obedience places the many justified. Folks, everyone here, everyone you know, is either in Adam or in Christ. There's no middle ground. And you were all in that, in that first birth, you were all born in Adam. All born in Adam. All born fallen. All born sinners. All born, if nothing changes in your disposition toward Jesus Christ, all born on the way to eternal. Adam. Paul means when he says in Adam, die. Ah. All human beings die. But he goes on and says, in Christ, all will be made alive. He's not talking here about everyone who's ever lived dies in Adam. Everyone who's ever lived lives in Christ. Verse 23, and we're going to get to that in a minute, qualifies it. 
you're here today. You're not. I don't. I'm not. I'm not interested in a decision somebody made. I, people make decisions all the time. They don't. Change. You have not had a transforming, life-transforming encounter with the living Jesus Christ, so that your life is no longer yours, but it now belongs to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the days of time alone, but for eternity. If you belong to Jesus, then you long to be with Jesus. You long to be with the people of Jesus. You long to be like Jesus. If you're not longing to be like Jesus, you don't belong in any sense of the word to Jesus. Still in Adam. All in Adam. Perish. There'll be a resurrection one day. Jesus refers to it as the goats. Deep in the goats. Deep will be raised. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Goats, cast these into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, where there's worms that consume but never completely consume, where there's a fire that burns but never completely consumes. Those are the two very distinct destinies. Everyone in this room, everyone you know, going to one place or the other, Christ, all we've met. He's going to tell us, but each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruit. And those who belong to him. We're going to stop here today. I want to ask you. I'm not going to ask you, you're a church member. Multitudes of church members perish in hell. Southern Baptist Convention claims. I've told you before, funny, but it's not. The FBI couldn't find half. Finest private investigators in the world. Found an eight. Got a Gideon's Army effect going. Of the eight that you can find, disproportionate number. A wall. They go to church as little as they can if they go at all. Can't stand being around the people. Can't stand being under the word. Impressive. Start whittling it down. And then don't be naive to think all who attend. Ask ourselves. I and Adam, still, because that's how you came into the world. My Christ. Do I belong to Adam? What does that look like? You just, you just long to be like Adam. Live like you want to. Bring a little religiosity on, just a little enough to make your conscience feel. Do I long to be? Like Jesus? Do I long to be with Jesus? According to what Jesus says, he passes this way every time two or more are gathered in his name. He passes this way in our Bible study. He passes this way in our morning worship time. He passes this way in our evening study times. He passes this way in our Wednesday times. We sing a hymn, when I was growing up, we sang, I'd never understood the hymn when I was growing up. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others you are calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear me. Anyone who's not like blind Bartimaeus and doesn't want to be put where the wind is blowing, doesn't want to be found in the most likely place where you're going to encounter Jesus in a, in a life-changing way, passing by. We come to this passage here on the resurrection, but you see, I've asked this question, and I'm going to keep asking it. Has, is there evidence in my life, has the resurrected king resurrected me? Am I living a life that shows that he is resurrecting me? 
that I'm being changed, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, from glory to glory, from one stage of sanctification, growing in grace. Or did I park it somewhere along the way? I think that my, my changes in the past are enough to carry me to the... No. Yesterday's manna will not feed you. You need fresh manna every day. I'll leave you with this this morning. And Adam, Christ. Not how you feel. Under the examining microscope, the Word of God. The Lord knows. I'm not sure you need to talk to Him about it. I've never been. Today, bring me in. Saving relationship with God. If you've never pretended to be, then you're an Adam. God, pass me by. Pass me by. Bring me out of Adam. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you for the, for the act of obedience, that, that life of Jesus, which was one continual second after second, into moment after moment, into hour after hour, into day after day, into year after year. He perfectly kept your law. Something you told us to do. Have not. Oh. Come unto me. All who are. I thank you for those here today who have come out of Adam. Living for Christ. Loving Jesus. Following Jesus. Going to be with Jesus when he meets with his people. Going to be with Jesus alone in our own devotion time. Oh Lord, I pray today for those who are yet in Adam. Whether they have a church membership card or not, in Adam. And I pray your grace, stir them up to not be satisfied, not be content until they're found in Christ. Thankful we can hope this today because Christ is in fact risen. Take these prayers in Jesus.